here today with Nick Haley, successful volleyball coach at literally every level, uh, both club, junior college, college, national team. And, uh, and Mick, we appreciate your time. And we want to talk a little bit about statistics. And uh, at least start off talking about statistics and we might uh, dovetail into some other things. But I know, you know, with the various software programs out there, you can get volumes and volumes of numbers. Um, and since most of our constituency, I'd say about 50% are club coaches, high school club coaches, and 50% are high school, or excuse me, uh, collegiate coaches. As a collegiate coach, but somebody who's coached club, what are the numbers that jump out to you as you evaluate a match or as you plan practice, as you go into the next match, what numbers are critical to your team's success? Well, there's probably three or four that just jump out at me without framing why they're important. Uh, always, I have the t-shirts to say, no pass, no play. So, always the passing number is critical because as a team, we need to be at a 2.3 on a five-point scale, zero to four. Uh, we need to be at a 2.3 or better to have a chance to to win the first ball kill game, which is absolutely the most important thing in being successful. So passing, passing is extremely important, and we look at that. Um, of course, hitting in rally score is the way you score points. Points scored is extremely important. So I, I need to know how many points per set we can score with the attack. How many kills we can get per set. Uh, and we basically need 16 or more to really be assured that we're going to have over 80% chance to win. Uh, so that's important. And serving, uh, several different things about the serving. Uh, I'm, I'm not as interested in aces except that aces get me points. So if I can get one or two aces per set, now I'm adding up points. I've got 16 kills, I've got two aces, that's 18 points that I've earned on our own or my team's earned on their own. And then I'm, I'm least likely to worry about blocking, but because the numbers would indicate most collegiate teams get between one and three stuff blocks per set. That's one or three points per set. So if I take my one point, now I've got 19 for one stuff block per set. Now I'm, I've either got to force the other team to give me six points so I can get to 25 first, so I want to force them into three or four hitting errors, three or four serving errors, something like that, a uh, violation here or there, and I'm going to win the game. So does the, um, these stats that you're focusing on, if it's first ball, kill, um, serve, pass, how does that impact how you allocate time to those skills in practice? Well, it, that's a great question because that's exactly what we spend our time on. First of all, we work on the first ball kill all the time. That's serve-receive to set to score. We don't have to play defense if we first ball kill all the time. So we work on that in all six rotations. In each rotation of the six rotations, we'll work on that. And we'll work on the serve-receive patterns. We'll work on the skill of passing. The setter's location, setter's choices, good set, smart set, then a tricky set, just the axioms of that to first ball kill. The teams that win are usually good first in the first ball kill. Then second focus is uh, dig to kill, the, the first transition to kill. And then the second transition, the second attempt at dig to kill. So, and dig to kill is another number I'm always looking at, incidentally. A lot of people keep digs. I don't give you credit for a dig unless we get a kill off of it. So dig to kill needs to be at 28 to 
uh, minimally all the time so that I know that my dig to kill part of the game is starting to score uh, for us also. So there, there's a lot of factors, but to keep it really simple, you focus on first ball kill. We practice that, we get organized. Then we watch the numbers as the season goes along. And we won't practice all six rotations. We'll practice the rotations we're not scoring well in. So we'll keep our focus on those rotations. So if I can get all six rotations up at a certain percentage, then I know that uh, I'm in pretty good shape there and I can go on to working on defending and scoring in the transition game off the defense. And the first ball transition is the next phase that you want to be really good are at. Are your players um, are cognizant of all these numbers? I mean, how do you communicate what you see, maybe establish goals for them? I mean, a lot of times numbers mean a lot to a coach. I mean, they may not mean quite so much to a player. What are the numbers that you really emphasize to players? Well, the dig to kill for my libero and my, my back row players is really important. So I try to get them all over 32% dig to kill. Excuse me, interruption. Now, would that be, since you have coached younger ages, you know, 15, 16, 17, would that be a similar number? The numbers go down. The percentages go down as the level goes down um, in some cases. And as, as you get younger, serving becomes more of a factor or maybe is almost as important a factor as attacking uh, because velocity and, and reaction time, uh, those kinds of things come into play. Uh, the, what I'm giving you right now is what I thought you asked me for was the collegiate uh, norms that we use. So if we're talking dig to kill, all of our players know they want to be over 32%. And if they are, they can walk out of here feeling like they did at least a decent job that way. Uh, we want our passers to be over 2.3. We'd love to have them be at 2.5, but 2.3 is our benchmark for getting close to success. So if we have three receivers over 2.3, coaches are happy. Usually the receivers are happy. <laughs> That's an important stat. Um, outside hitters, we'd love to have them be 300 uh, or better. Uh, but it's tough because they're going to get a lot of different sets in a lot of different situations. You're talking about three kills out of every ten, or four kills out of ten with only one error, or 50% kill, five kills in ten swings with two errors allowed. Still, you're at 300. So you, you're getting more kills, scoring more points. You give up a couple of errors. We're still at a successful level for our outside hitters. They can be over 300 every night as an outside attacker. You're really doing quite well. Middles are a lot higher. They should score uh, at a much higher level. Um, we had three middles. We only played two, but we rotated them around this year. We had three middles. All in the conference were over 360, 370 for the season. First time I've had that happen. I attribute that to my All-American setter, Kendall Bateman who is very, very good at her selection and her location. Um, and she really gave those hitters confidence. So, But uh, in the women's game, you like to have your medals hitting around 400 if you can get them there. So those are numbers. And then serving, um, we like to have our servers serve at a, a three, uh, excuse me, a 1.7 or better. Anything over a 1.7 really means you put the defense, uh, you put the other team on the defensive with your serving. If you look at a lot of, a lot of serving stats, a lot of people are 1-3, one, 1-4, one, that kind of thing. Um, we get a 1-7 and we're really attacking, that's good. If we go to position serving, uh, where we're just trying to serve a location to disrupt patterns or those kinds of things, that number may go lower and we would, we would tell the team, well, our serving numbers were lower tonight, but we really didn't turn you loose because we wanted you to serve certain zones or positions. Um, and we were successful with that, so don't worry about it. That, that's fine. And along that, that line, it kind of begs the question, do, your serving strategy might change relative to opponent. If, yeah. If you have somebody that is a good side-out, first ball, side-out team, do you attempt to serve them 
tougher since they're going to side out at a high percentage anyway, or do we want to serve it in and we're, we're going to work on blocking and digging and have that be part of our strategy? Is there a component in terms of your opponent skills dictating your strategy? Well, it certainly is because using the examples that you just gave, um, maybe the team is so good because they have one hitter that's terminating all three of those rotations. So the serving might be to put her in a situation that doesn't allow her to be as good as she normally is, even though you're not getting aces. Um, another way to do it would be to open up and use your velocity and really try to keep the ball off the net so you could get a double block or even a triple block sometimes on that particular person so you could defend more at the net. Uh, in some cases, and you could get your defense set up a little earlier to defend against either the high velocity or the skill of her attacking, uh, whichever that is. In the case of where a team has three very good attackers, or four even, with one coming out of the back row, your strategy might be to just try to disrupt as much as you can so you make it simpler for your defense to get set up and get a double block uh, in most cases. I think we feel good if we can if we can get a good double block and get our defense uh, set in the right spots before the other team attacks, then we feel we have the best chance to reduce the number of points they can score uh, in those rotations. The college coaches out there, if there's one stat that they should prioritize, what would it be? And would it be the same or different if you're coaching high school or club level players? Well, I think it's safe to say in, in the rally score game, it would be safe to say that if you could focus on uh, the first ball kill uh, part of your game, uh, the better you are at that, at all levels, the more you're going to win. Um, and that just means that you will know... Uh, you will know your rotations, each of your six rotations. You'll know uh, who's passing and that sort of thing. You'll really, really know each of those, each of those rotations and have those under control. Uh, that's probably the one thing that people lose sight of is making sure that their first ball kill is effective in most cases. And maybe against different types of serves, there's, there's a lot of things you have to adjust for. A uh, good topspin serve versus a good hard floater, um, uh, those kinds of things. So I think the first ball kills where everybody should be paying attention. You, uh, kind of on a, a different note, within, the, within a match, will you take the numbers that you're being fed as the match unfolds, and will you make changes maybe by rotation? You know, I start in rotation four as opposed to rotation two or something like that. Uh, where you talk to your setter about set distribution. Uh, so do you make those changes on the fly or do you rely on seasonal stats with the idea of as this match unfolds, we'll revert to the mean and things will, will assume a familiar picture? Well, we'll do both of those. Obviously, during the match, we have access not only to our numbers but to their numbers, the opponent's numbers. Um, one of the things is if we're not being successful at, let's say, first ball kill, we might rotate. Or if they're being too successful at first ball kill and they're, they're getting more kills than we anticipated that they would get, then we need to slow that down, we would change. Uh, if we're not scoring, the way we like. We have two choices. We can change the master up so we can change the people. Or we can just do a better job of executing. You know, there, there's something to uh, familiarity and sometimes your better players need, can go two games and not, not really get it. But if you know that they're working at it and you trust that they understand the situation, by the third game they usually solve some of those problems. And rather than change, we know the percentages are in our favor how we start. We'll always try to start with the percentages in our favor relative to how we think the opponents are going to start. 
But when they start turning the dial and you start turning the dial, then there's a couple games that go back and forth that are interesting. Um, our fifth game against Illinois this year that we lost, uh, I, I always have trouble with this one. Uh, the numbers say we should start with Alex Jupiter in the left front. Uh, X number of kills uh, for three straight years, records at USC, uh, you know, the numbers dictate you should start there. And we rotated, we rotated Alex to that point to start. But we changed the matchups. And the matchups are comfortable. Sometimes the numbers don't, don't become as important as the players being comfortable of who they're playing against and who they're seeing across the net. So I always have trouble with this. And all of the, um, the numbers guru people, they always want you to go, and women's teams internationally, they'll always, almost always have their best scorer left front right away. I mean, that's just the highest percentage chance to win. But I found that that's not always, that doesn't always hold true, and it didn't hold true for us in this, in this match against Illinois. I sometimes think Alex comes on better after she's one time in the front row, three times in the back row, and then she's really ready to go. However, if you think about it, a 15-point game goes maybe 9 to 11 rotations. And if you don't start her in the front row and she's only in the back row three times and then your 7th, 8th, and ninth rotations, the score is getting close to 15 and your best attacker is still in the back row, that always would give coaches fits. They're thinking, I've got to get her back up there so we can score again. Sometimes you just have to trust the matchups to make everybody more comfortable and, and it works out and people step up in those situations. Okay, if we could uh, maybe dovetail a different direction. You mentioned the international game where you, you were successful coaching international um, and then you were successful in university, went into the, uh, the world arena, were successful there, then back to the university. Did uh, the four years of being able to coach internationally impact how you perceive the game collegiately and are you a different coach for having coached internationally? I guess I'm clumsily trying to ask. Yeah, no question that that probably was the most significant um, factor in my coaching career. I, I felt, honestly, I felt for all those years before I went to the national team that I was doing things by feel. We didn't have numbers. Um, I didn't always see what I'm telling you right now because of the numbers. It was always a feel, so I was uh, like the deaf, dumb, and blind kid and uh, playing a mean pinball, uh, if you would. Uh, going to the national team allowed a single focus, 10 to 12 hours a day, on one thing for four straight years. Uh, and I had to get some help. Uh, bringing Toshi Yoshida back, who had helped us in uh, 79, 80, and 81 with Ari's teams, was significant because uh, he coached a different kind of volleyball in Japan than what the world was playing uh, and what we were playing. And so it uh, gave me an idea to see things a little bit differently um, and then train a little bit differently and the result during that time was we went and shifted volleyball from the side out game to the rally score game. Uh, and I got really, really excited at that point because I could understand much better and feel much more comfortable about my decisions about who I played, where I played them, and how I played them because the numbers would reinforce my position and then I'd be willing to take a few more chances on my gut feeling because I'd had a good track record of of that in in the previous years. So combining those two, I felt coming to the university here at USC from the national team experience really gave me a tremendous advantage. Just doing the the international uh, four years, taking a time out from the collegiate game, and doing that really got me to look at the game much more specifically. I think a misnomer I had is when you move up a level, 
you don't you don't break it down as much your more systems work and the more elite athlete you work with the more they demand you break it down more for them they want to be perfect they want you to help them be the very best in the world and every one of those athletes wants that if they're going to try to win the world so to speak um, our athletes were like that and uh, then I had to ask myself some serious questions that I'd never asked myself about how to do certain things. And uh, so that whole experience uh, uh, was a great lab experience for me and the national team did pretty well. You know, we were, we were seven points away from playing in the gold medal match. It was 7-7 seven, seven in the fifth game against Russia in the semifinals. And I had Daniel Scott and Tara uh, battle cross in the front row with Robin and Moe setting and we had everything we wanted up there uh, against the Russians and uh, I don't think we scored but one more point. <laughs> How would you balance um, you know the, the desire or the how should I phrase this the, the skill acquisition component of coaching with the physical training component um, you know, kids that are 15, 16, 17, they need physical training to prepare for what's, what awaits them at the collegiate level. At the same time, they need to learn how to pass and set and hit and dig and, and those types of things. Would you have a, an opinion relative to prioritizing one over the other? Uh, or maybe physical training is more important than what a lot of coaches, you know, allow time for? Is that general question? Well, I'm doing an experiment right now. Uh, my wife and I uh, and some folks here have started our own club. No different than every other parent in the country, right? And your kid doesn't play, so you start your own club. Well, that wasn't my reason for doing this. Uh, but I wanted to try something different, so I think I have some, some feelings uh, about that. We put a nutrition component, a physical conditioning component, in with the skill acquisition component. Uh, we put a biomechanics component in, meaning that we didn't teach anything that we couldn't support scientifically to be good in the way of movement and efficiency. Uh, we have all these people involved in the program watching, and then we teach our coaches how to teach this stuff e efficiently. And we tried to quit talking to the players and we put television sets on each court with uh, TiVo units that we got off of Craigslist for $30 and cracked them and have a seven second delay. So the player always can turn after she made a play and see what it looked like. See if the feeling matched up with the pictures. And then on the sides of the TV we had photographs of, of the of the skill that we wanted them to see how they should look so when they looked in the TV they could see if it matched up with the picture. To get back to your question, I really feel that the physical, physical component is important. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it being heavy weights as much as if you're going to do weights you should be technically perfect without hardly any weight because if we can get them to that point when they've finally gotten their last growth and, and can start to lift effectively that certainly helps them and the reason you do the physical component is so they can train longer and if they can train longer they develop the skill better because this is a repetition sport in some cases they can hold their posture better and that sort of thing but I like to combine the physical training with the skill acquisition and the one thing that I, I have watched and observed and I'm really uh, uh, sure that I'm right about this is we never spend less than 20 minutes on passing every practice no matter if it's an hour and a half practice or a three hour practice I probably never spend more than 30 minutes in just passing breakouts but that doesn't mean they won't be passing the rest of the practice the passing is the one thing that I spend 20 to 30 minutes on every practice. The other thing I would spend at least uh, 45 minutes on would be six on six 
if not more. No matter what I'm working on, whether I'm just working on uh, a back row attack or working against two blockers outside, but the combination of three skills. When I was with the national team, we, we put in what we called an up-down movement after the skills. People thought it was a skill. In other words, you dig a ball, you do an up, down, and back up movement. And people never understood why that was there. That was there to determine balance. You know, if you'll use an up-down in your skills, you'll find your dig to kill will go up exponentially. Up-down also does something for American kids that some other cultures do. It makes it a lot stronger below 90 degrees. And to hold your posture for most of the skills that we do on the floor, you really need that kind of strength in the low position. So we've maintained that also, and we do that in every one of the drills we do, even if we don't use it in the six on six, just to get our technique right and that sort of thing. So, so I believe the answer to the question is, uh, I combine the physical training with the skills. Uh, I really think once the youngsters are underdeveloped physically, they plateau and they can't go any farther with their readers, skills. Our readers or viewers um, asked if you had any tips to developing a good arm swing. You know, so often as these kids are growing up, they develop horrendous arm swings, and it, then it's a hard habit to break. Is there anything um, that might help out when we're looking at, uh, you know, especially females 14, 15 years old? You know who did the best job, I thought, ever uh, with arm swings? Uh, and arm swings are the most difficult thing to change. So your viewer's right. You don't want anybody to start badly because trying to change them after they develop the, the arm swing patterns you either are going to improve them or they're going to be worse. I've never seen anybody that's the same. So I hesitate to ever mess with an arm swing, but if I'm going to do it, and I, I actually learned this from a uh, junior coach, uh, Wes Lyon at Munciana, I think was, and, and maybe the Shondells were part of that and all the other people that worked in that program, they were the best at having every one of the kids in their club with the best mechanical arm swing uh, that I have seen. And I purposely went to Muncie to go to the club practices to watch what they were doing. And they broke it down more than anybody I've ever seen break it down. They put the kids on boxes and they actually started them in the right positions. Then they used bands to develop the small muscles around those areas. Uh, and they had a picture of what they wanted it to look like. And then from getting, getting the arm swing and the contact point to where they wanted it, then they backed down and worked on the approach, the footwork, the, uh, the arms into the air and that sort of thing. But, but basically the, the biggest problem I see is people almost use too long an arm swing when they don't have a good vertical jump and they never get up to the present position quick enough to be able to fire as they reach the top of their jump and then most always are trying to swing as they're coming back down. So having a good approach that maximizes the time you can be in the air and then realizing the hands need to be above your head before your feet come off the floor is critical and not allowing them to slow down as they approach but actually increasing the speed so that all of that can happen really get you to the point where you get here. Now this won't do you any good and won't work if you haven't practiced and have these small muscles in the right uh, hitting position and to be able to swing through the ball from that position. Well it's funny you mentioned Muncie because we were out there last week videoing their 12 year olds. Ah. And they're, as you just suggested, they are on boxes with little mini balls. Yep. They had them going from the different segments of the arm swing. It was, it was, it was fascinating to watch and yeah, it's a, it's a point well taken. Last question. Um, this is more of a, an observation on your part. If relative to our player development system in our country, which you know, club through the university programs, eventually maybe through uh, to a national team level, is there anything that you would suggest as items that we might consider to make that system better? Right now, I think volleyball and the coaches that have been responsible and the people that have been responsible for the leadership 
our sport is getting everybody's attention. From the way we recruit, to the recruiting system we have, to the way our clubs are developed, to the way we have uh, organization of all the players playing in the country right now, in the, in the club part of that, that's probably the best of any sport out there for the numbers. Um, as far as the coaching is concerned, I, I believe our coaches have taken a tremendous jump up because most of the clubs now are, are getting tremendously good instruction. Um, what I've been seeing lately uh, is very, very good. And I'm trying to figure out where these people came from that are coaching because if they didn't play like we did, we started playing and then we worked into this. Uh, I don't see a lot of open ball anymore or know where these people are playing. And uh, when I see a dynamic young female coach, I, I probably think she's a, been a collegiate athlete and that sort of thing. But I see a lot of young uh, male coaches who are doing a really good job also, and I don't know where they're getting this. So uh, it's kind of good they're either watching the collegiate game or they're tuning in to what you're doing uh, or they're paying attention. So I think our system is very good. If we're going to get better, though, uh, we can't keep messing around with the rules. Uh, every place I went in the world when I was the national team coach, they would come up, uh, foreign volleyball people would come up and ask me, why do you people play with a different set of rules? Volleyball is volleyball. It is a family, one set of rules. And uh, I learned to appreciate that. I do like our 10 to 12 substitutions. I believe the international game might move to more substitutions, like eight. But the college game is taking a terrible setback by going to 15 substitutions again because the coaches will start to specialize and our best athletes will not be playing six rotations anymore. And that will hurt the development of the game at the top level. Yeah, we've got to continue to allow the elite athletes to touch the ball uh, in the backcourt as well as the front court. If I'm an elite athlete and I want to play this game, and I want to touch the ball, if the indoor people will not leave me in the game so I can get good, and Hooker is the best example of that, uh, you know, if she hadn't have been able to get into the back court, she would not be maybe one of the best players in the world right now. It's interesting you say that because uh, I had a coach approach me one time. Where he had a daughter that was 13 or 14 years old, and uh, she told him, I don't want to block middle because middles only get to play three rotations. <laughs> That's exactly and, Yeah, I never thought in, the, in those terms, but it's, it's a point well taken. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and having done enough of the international stuff to... Uh, to at least experience it, I, yeah, I think it's a, a much better game in terms of just the symmetry where everybody plays six rotations um, and there's no front row, back row subbing going on. It's, it's a different game. It's, you could argue better or worse, but it's certainly different. I, I would uh, encourage your viewers to think about one thing we could do is if we didn't allow libero position to be played before age 18, and we took all of the great athletes who were left sides who couldn't step up to the international level and allowed them to become the next liberos, we would be way ahead as far as player development at the top level. And the colleges and universities would even be more well served with the elite athletes. I, I am so appreciative of your time. And I, and I think uh, speaking on behalf of the people who are going to be watching this, um, their, the ability to uh, kind of listen to your insights, I think, is extremely valuable and, and certainly much appreciated. Thanks, Jim. Good to do it. Mm -hmm.